Now with the vector space, we have 10 axioms. Okay, We don't need to know all those axioms by heart. right? You would encounter those more directly in a full-fledged linear algebra course. But I just want to, again, make the point that these axioms essentially give us a, ge a geometry and an algebra, for that matter, that cohere with our intuitions about kind of how the world works. So for instance, one of those axioms is called a closure axiom or closure condition. In other words, if I just take two vectors in my vector space and add them together, I'm going to call my vector space V, okay? capital V here. If I add two vectors together in my space, I get closure. In other words, the sum of those vectors is still a vector in the space, still an arrow in the space. Now, is that true of R2 and R3? Of course it is. So for instance, if I look at a simple example, let's say an R2 in the plane here, and I draw a vector, just as we've done before, and a vector U and a vector V, and I add them together, sure enough, no matter where I place those vectors in the plane, when I add them together, their sum, that resultant vector, is still going to be in the space. So we have closure um, with respect to the addition of vectors. Now we also want closure, there's sort of a second type of closure. In this case, with respect to what was our other operation fundamentally, that was scalar multiplication. So of course we also want uh, closure with respect to scalar multiplication. So in other words, if I take any scalar value, you want this in total generality, if I take any scalar value and scale any vector in my vector space V by that scalar value, I'm closed. In other words, I'm still in the vector space. And we can all see that that happens as well. If I take a vector V in R2 and I scale it, I just stretch it, I'm still going to be a vector fundamentally contained in my vector space. So we get closure that way. To have a nice algebraic structure, we need something like a zero in our vector space. So there needs to be a zero vector in V. Okay? So in R2, for instance, that would of course just be the vector 0, 0. Similarly, to maintain kind of a nice uh, structural underpinning here, we also in our scalar set need some sort of multiplicative identity. And that's typically of course denoted with a 1. So when I scale any vector by 1 in my scalar set, I get that vector back. Just to see another example, and we've seen actually this one before, we need something like this, the commutativity of vector addition. In other words, when I add vector u to vector v in that order, that's going to be consistent as if I added vector v to u in that particular order. So that's called the commutative property of vector addition. Just to mention one more here, we also want something like this, just so if I have three vectors and I add them together, it shouldn't matter the order in which I perform that addition. So for instance, if I grouped u plus v together first and then added that sum to the vector w, that should still be equal to if I added these vectors together in a different order, if I reassociated them, in other words, and added v plus w together first and then subsequently added u, I should get the same result. And of course you do. That's one of the defining features of a vector space. And that's true of vector addition by definition, as we saw previously. And this is called the associative property of vector addition. So I can associate vectors in any order when I add them. So there are a few more axioms. I'll leave out those finer details. But the, essentially, the, the point at the end here of defining a vector space is we want closure so we can sort of consistently stay within our domain of vectors. And we also want identity elements. And then we also want our sort of intuition about how we adds, add things together. It's going to be, um, in this sense, commutative and associative when we add groups together. So there is the basics of a vector space.